Hello everybody and welcome back and on the bench today as you can see we have our next project and it is a realistic model STA2000 stereo receiver and uh, this receiver that was built for about two years I think from Radio Shack this one was released between 1977 and 1978 and then in 1979 <clears throat> they released like an updated version of this called the 2000D which stands for Dolby and that had the uh, had like a Dolby uh, noise reduction you know on the FM and so forth I believe so uh, when this came in I heard uh, I think the report was I haven't even plugged it in yet but I think it's got a dead channel or something so uh, we have some repairs to make on it first and then uh, the owner wants to have it recapped and gone over and kind of basically put back into its former glory so he can use it for another 30 years. He, I th believe he said he owned it since it was brand new. So uh, yeah, let's check it out. And when I hear that there's dead channels and things, I don't usually just go ahead and plug it in. So we'll probably take the cover off and just kind of look at some things first and then uh, kind of assess whether we should risk turning anything on. So stand by and uh, We'll see what happens. All right, we got this thing apart and just giving it an initial look. Um, there were a lot of different screws, as you can see, holding it together. So I do know this thing at least was taken apart before, but looking at the backs of the boards so far, it doesn't look like there's been any work done on it, um, at least that I can see. Now, one of the things I notice is um, on this module they're using one capacitor and on this module they're using another capacitor they're all made by Elna and so I believe they're all factory originals but I just think that when they assembled this uh, the two modules came you know when they assembled the modules in the factory they just used whatever capacitors <clears throat> they had at the time now that you know but once again it also could be that at some point in time one of these modules was replaced I don't know not knowing the history of it uh, I'm connected up to the dim bulb tester and really the only thing I want to see right now uh, nothing looks shorted physically or anything nothing looks blown or burned so we're just gonna do an initial power up and we're gonna check the dim bulb and just see if it charge if the capacitors charge and then the light dims down and then we're also going to check and see if our relay clicks and if it comes out of protect so here's our dim bulb let's turn it on and see what we get you can see how bright that got and then it dimmed way down so that's a good thing so there's no dead shorts at least that we see however um, the relay is not pulling in so that tells me there is some sort of a uh, failed component in here somewhere somewhere now it wouldn't surprise me if one or more of the capacitors in here are leaky it would not surprise me if one of the outputs is not shorted or one of the drivers or small signal transistors isn't bad on here um, we do have low voltage because obviously the you know the all of the panel lights are coming on so let's flip this thing up on its side and let's check some voltages and see what we got now I have you zoomed in here on the main filter capacitors and if you look here the you can see where they're tied together at the common point and you can see there's a negative lead right here um, but one of the things that I find strange is that here is a ground tab right here and you don't see any bonding between the center tap and the ground tab there so I don't know if this thing's using a floating ground or if it's just tied to common somewhere else uh, not sure but we're going to measure this to see if we have our positive and negative uh, DC rail voltage so uh, let me get get the shot lined up for that and we'll test it out all right so let's turn the power back on and let's look at this I believe is going to be our negative voltage and you can see we have negative 
41 volts there. And here's going to be our positive. Positive 41 there. So we know at least we have our main uh, DC voltage going out to the output transistors and it's not shorted. Um, I'm looking at the fuses right now up here and none of them, at least that I can see, appear to be open. They all look to be good. So I don't see any blown fuses. I do see a lot of that glue, that goop that they put on these transistors. And I do see, like this transistor here has a whole ton of goop on it. And you can see on the collector of this transistor, I've got almost 31 volts. All right, let me get that in a little bit better in a shot. Um, how about this one? About 17 volts there. So I'm going to have to go get the schematic out now and uh, kind of take a look at this. But initially, at least from what I can see, there's negative 31. So our power supply seemed to be here. So what that's telling me is we're probably going to find something on one of the output, you know, power output modules or something that's like an output transistor or something is failing. That's my initial guess. But before we do anything else, I'm probably going to want to go through all this and verify all the voltages and so forth and kind of get acclimated with where everything is on the schematics. So uh, let's get some schematics and see if we can dig a little deeper. All right, we got the schematics out for this thing now. And here's the protect circuit. And it makes it look like a separate circuit board, but if you look down here, it shares the circuit board with the metering circuit and everything. This is kind of an odd layout of a system here, the way they do the schematics and everything. And some of this is really small and hard to see. But if you look down here, I'm interested in pins 3 and pin 4, which is the left and right outputs from the amplifier. If there's something wrong with the amplifier here, it'll put, you know, you'll see, you should see zero volts on these at idle, on pins three and four. If you do not, um, chances are, that's where your problem is going to be. You have a shorted, maybe a shorted output transistor or something like that. So let's turn this thing on, and let's look at pins, looks like three and four. Yeah, right there, three and four. So, let's zoom in a little bit. There's one, two, three, and four. So, that's going to be these two right here. And uh, let me get a meter in, into view here. And we'll uh, back off a little bit. So, here's pin three. And there's zero volts, pretty much. And pin four, yep, oh, there it is, look. And you can see it's bouncing around. So there's a, there's a leaky transistor. Now that could be anything. That could be the output itself, one of the outputs. Or it could be um, one of the drivers and one of the small signal transistors. It could be a capacitor shorting, who knows. So pin four, if we look at that, that is your left channel, which I believe is going to be this one over here, right here. So uh, yeah, let's shut this off. And now we can start poking around on there and see if we can find, get it narrowed down to the actual component. I think at the end of the day, we're going to find maybe a shorted output, but I don't know. It's not dead shorted because you notice that voltage was varying all over the place. So chances are we may not be able to just measure that um, as a dead short. So we're going to have to kind of trace it down to the component. All right, I have the left channel apart, and this amp has definitely been worked on. Um, there was a screw missing from up here. Um, 
mismatched screws on the bottom. So this has been out before, I'm pretty sure. But strangely enough, looking at the bottom of this board, uh, there may have been a little bit of work done. I don't know, but it doesn't really look like much work, if any, has been done. Right here I see one little solder joint. Could be a little bit. May have had touched up, but maybe not. Uh, maybe up here. Yeah, there's probably been a little bit of work in here. Um, okay, right off the bat, I can see now that I have it apart. Let's see if we can zoom you in a little bit so you can see. You see what I see? Right down there. And that is... Uh, I mean, that's just corrosion, severe corrosion, and that resistor, yep, that resistor's been replaced because it does not match the one on the other side, on the other channel. Um, it's a regular carbon comp, old style. So, yeah, this has been worked on. So, uh, we've definitely had some work done on this amp at some point in time. So, we're going to have to figure out what all's wrong here. Um, just looking, comparing with the other channel, even the value of the resistor doesn't seem to match. Because this one here looks to be, I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. We're going to have to, wow, that's pretty burned up too. That capacitor looks like it's fried. So we're going to have to do some testing on this board. Um, Definitely needs recapped, obviously. And uh, so we'll pop a couple components off the board here and do some testing, and then we'll be back. All right, looking a little bit closer, uh, these transistors, at least on one of them, have been replaced. Um, I don't know if the ones on here are original and the ones on this channel have been replaced or whatever, but they are definitely different manufacturers, different everything different so the outputs are definitely going to need replaced on this so uh, getting into a little bit you know a little bit of repair work here so I'm gonna kind of stop the video here for a second and I'm gonna reach out to the owner and kind of get his thoughts on what he would like me to do here and um, we're gonna go from there I've done a little more testing here. Um, I checked the two output transistors. Now these are not original transistors, at least they don't seem to, they might be, um, but they don't match the part numbers listed in the service manual, but that's okay because sometimes they'll switch them with like types, you know, um, during a production run. So they may be original or may not, I don't know. Uh, but they do not read shorted, they do read okay. Um, now down in here is a different story. Uh, I think this cap is leaking. This transistor is bad. This diode is reading okay, but it is very badly corroded. Um, and that's probably from the cap leaking or from the glue. Or so. As you can see down in here, it's pretty, pretty cruddy. Um, this resistor, I don't know if it's the right value for in here. I'm going to have to look that up. Um, so there's definitely some, oh, and this resistor is completely open right here. Let me back up. This resistor right here is completely open. It's a 150 ohm resistor. It's reading into the mega ohms. So there's a bunch of little things on here that are going to need done. Um, obviously, recapping it will help a lot. And hopefully, the couple of bad resistors, I am going to replace this diode. Um, and of course the recap uh, should bring this thing back to life. Now, um, I believe the owner want, gave me the go ahead to uh, just replace the transistors anyways. Uh, these ones are obviously good, but they are definitely not the same make and manufacture as the other channel. Uh, some people that doesn't bother them as long as, I mean, they're semiconductors, as long as they work and function properly, they're happy. Uh, 
I don't, it's just my personal belief. I like to use the same transistors on both channels with the same characteristics. Um, it's just a personal preference of mine. So if it were if this were my receiver, undoubtedly I would replace the for what they cost the four transistors. So we're going to do that for them, and uh, I'm going to go through and, and check the rest of this. But so far, that's what I've found. So there you go. All right, we're on the schematic here for the uh, power amplifier, and sorry about the fans going on for the desoldering station and everything, but. Here is our 539, and if you notice, it is a 470 ohm, one half watt. And just as I suspected, I, that didn't look right to me. Um, the one that's in there is actually a 4.7K at half watt. So that's definitely the wrong value. Um, I will probably go in there and replace that, and possibly replace its mate, which would be 537, which is a 470 ohm, but I'll, I'll check it. Maybe it's good. Um, we'll have to find that on there and check it out as well. So anyway, there you go. That's where we're at. So we have, uh, have some components to do some swapping out on. Right, here's that transistor that I suspected was bad. And you can see it is bad. So among other things, that was uh, one of our big problems there. And then we also had the problems with the uh, resistors and some, you know, possibly leaky capacitors. So we're uh, moving along here. Well, I must be living right here because uh, <laughs> um, this transistor was bad and this transistor was bad and I had both of them new old stock in stock there they were I mean what are the odds but um, this one had just it had pulled loose from its casing it's mounted to the heat sink and everything it's still red good but it was funky this one here on the other hand was a bear to figure out um, you know, all these voltages were wrong here, and I knew I had to be getting my 40 volt line up into this mess through here somewhere. But just looking at the transistor statically checking it was very difficult. Um, it checked good. And here's a new one. Here's the new old stock. Let's, do, let's look at this one first and uh, see what it's supposed to do when it's correct. So you can see it's an NPN transistor, and it goes through, and you know everything's good. Now, this other one, on the other hand, here's the original one. It was really only after I took it out and physically tested it like this that I was able to see what it was acting like. It's acting like a common diode network, like just two back-to-back -back diodes. And you can see, very strange. <laughs> so, that was a little bit weird. So, it kind of worked, but it didn't work, and yeah. So, let's get this new one put in here, and... Uh, see if we can get this thing to work now all right I very precariously have the meter on this little test point here which is where we were getting at 32 or 34 volts or whatever um, and it was causing the protect circuit to hold in and I got my meter hooked up to it I have everything set up as you can see the board is all reassembled um, I have the new capacitor right here, and I have it all recapped. I have the bad resistors replaced. I have the transistor that was over here that was faulty. It's replaced, and I'm pretty sure now that we got all the problems taken care of. 
So let's look and see, and really what, we, what we're looking for is as close to zero volts as possible right over here on this. So I'm going to turn it on and see what the voltage does. And there you go, zero volts. Oh, there goes the protect. All right. So this thing is live now. The better news is that the other channel seems to be okay, at least it's functional. Now it's going to get recapped as well, and it's obviously going to be checked over and everything. Um, but I also want to make sure, uh, you know, and replace these transistors so that there's a match set in this side and in this side um, of outputs because they were four different outputs. So we just want to make sure those all match. But uh, hey, I think we're uh, getting really close here to getting this thing working properly. So, okay, let's continue on. Just wanted to stop here for a second and show you all something. I've removed two capacitors that I'm replacing, and if you notice, there's this hard kind of goo on here. It's, it's a glue that they put on there to hold the caps while they're being wave soldered. The problem is, this glue is corrosive, and if you noticed on the other board, this whole section in here was totally corroded away and burned up, and I think that may have even been what caused some of the problems, but not all of them. Um, but when you work on these, you want to be sure to get rid of as most of that, as much as this as you can. Now, you can't always get all of it off without damaging the board and the screening and everything, but any place that your capacitor is going to be touching, you do not want it to come in contact with this. Now, the lucky thing is, the old capacitors, you can see how big they are, and the new ones, which are the same value, um, much smaller. And you know, these ones are only 85 degree uh, capacitors. These ones are 105s. Um, they're just, they're really high quality, but they're a lot smaller. So, you can pick away the glue that's around there, and make sure that your cap doesn't come in contact with that or it'll just corrode the heck out of all the leads you know all this stuff around here clean it off uh, you can use rubbing alcohol and just kind of scrape away at it and clean it off so I just want to show you that real quick all right I just want to show you this um, this one signal capacitor is an electrolytic it's only 0.47 microfarads at 50 volts and when I replace these ones, all these small, like anything below 4 microfarads, um, I like to replace them with these. Um, these are film capacitors. They are non-polarized, whereas these little electrolytics are polarized. Not that that really matters for, you know, for this application. Um, you can replace a polarized capacitor with a non-polarized, but you cannot replace a non-polarized with a polarized, if that makes sense to you. But uh, just my personal opinion from experience, using these little tiny film capacitors, they just seem to have a lot better sound quality than these electrolytics. Um, some people may disagree with that or may say there's not any difference, especially if you get real high quality electrolytics. But these just seem to be a little bit, uh, I don't know, just a little bit brighter sounding. Um, I just, I, th I like the sound of them better. So I always replace them with these. The other thing is, these are never going to wear out. They'll last forever. It's the last capacitor you'll have to put um, into that unit when you replace them. So I just want to show that to you. There they are, and they're pretty tiny. Well, we're back to the power supply here on the bottom, and I'm going to call this part glue fest. Because if you look in here, this thing is just covered with glue, that gluey, gross stuff. So this is going to be a lot of fun, to say the least. But, uh, well, has to be done. So let's dig in. All right, take a look at what this does. Um, you can see right here that glue got all over this resistor lead and it just turned it into a big chunk of tarnish you can see in there. Um, the only way to fix that is to replace the resistor. If you don't replace the resistor, it'll work 
until that tarnish eats all the way through there. Um, sometimes you can clean them off with alcohol, but sometimes when they're that blobbed up already, you're better off just replacing it. Um, but you can see just how terrible that glue is. It's just awful. It gets all over everything. I try to clean as much as I can, but you know, there's always that balance of how much time you can spend um, on this versus, um, you know, <laughs> how much you need to spend. So I'm going to try to clean some more. Like I said, I got these, uh, these ones up here done, but uh, it is just a slow, tedious process to do this. And if you don't do it, it'll just end up that glue will get worse and worse with time and it'll just eat right through the leads of your brand new capacitors so you really at least need like I said need to clean around those holes all right we have the receiver mostly put back together now and uh, we're going to give it a little bit of a test here I'm going to turn on my signal generator and we're going to do our typical one kilohertz test um, before we do that, I'll go over really quick. Um, I'm not going to actually do the whole process because I've done it already off camera. But I'll go over the process of how you do the alignment on the, on the amplifier modules here. There's two very simple adjustments that you're going to make. And all you're going to do is you're going to connect for the first one. You're essentially going to connect across the speaker terminals. And this is for the DC balance and our DC offset right there and you can see here's the first process and all you're going to do is you're going to put no signal onto the amplifier and there are actually a lot of times most receivers this is a little unique on this procedure a lot of the receivers out there they want you to have the speaker terminals open they don't want anything connected to it on this one they're actually saying 8 ohm load now I can take that two different ways. Uh, one way is that you connect an open load to it and you adjust adjust your uh, DC balance um, for 17.5 millivolts for an 8 ohm load, which I don't believe that's what they mean. What they're saying is put an 8 ohm load across, uh, you know, dummy load across the speaker terminals. So you're actually measuring what the uh, you know what the offset voltage is in a perfect world what we're really looking to do is make zero volts at the speaker terminals when there's no signal being applied to the amplifier okay so you don't want any DC voltage on your speakers obviously the DC will instantly you know it will overheat the voice coil and eventually damage it and if it's too high it could damage it right away um, but we want basically this to be zero volts. The other thing that I've noticed with DC offset is if it's too far out, even if it doesn't damage your speakers, it can affect the sound quality at very low listening levels, um, you know, a little bit. So when you're listening to the amplifier very quietly, um, you can get better sound quality when this is tuned up better. So all you do is connect across the speaker terminals. I actually used this protect board as my test point. So you have a ground right here, this E, which is terminal number 19, and then right here are your two speaker terminals from the amplifier. These come directly from the amplifier modules, the right channel and the left channel. Um, and all you're going to do is you're going to connect your voltmeter on millivolts mode, okay, so you're going to measure millivolts, and you're going to go from the one terminal to ground, and then you're going to go to the, these two top potentiometers for the rights and the lefts. And you're just going to turn the amp on, let it warm up for about 20 minutes, and then measure and adjust it until you have as close to zero volts as you can. Okay, So they're saying they want, for this DC uh, offset, they want less than 20 millivolts. And I kind of jumped ahead on this other thing with 8 ohms. Let's get into that later. Sorry. <laughs> you know how it is. It's early in the morning here. So we want to set this as close to zero as possible. And they're saying 20 millivolts is the threshold of the maximum that they would accept. So, And I was actually able to get these to adjust down to about 1 millivolt, which is very good, both channels. 
So that's that one. The second adjustment, you're just going to clip your meter across this resistor or this resistor, depending what channel. Again, you're going to have an 8 ohm load connected. Okay, sometimes, like I said, in, in the, and this is for the actual idle current of the amplifier. So you have to have a little quiescent, quiescent current on the transistors to kind of overcome what we call crossover distortion and things. We won't get into that right now, but anyways, we're going to put our meter across this resistor and then you have this other potentiometer down here, one here and one here underneath these, these blue transistors. And again, after the amp's been running about 20 minutes, you're just going to adjust it until you see 17.5 millivolts with an 8 ohm load connected. Okay, so very simple. And that's your idle current. If you set that higher, what's going to happen, um, one of the big things that could happen is it will just up cause these to sit there and run very warm or in some cases if you go too far they'll run really hot and again it will also uh, can add to distortion and things like that so you you want the transistors to be turned on uh, rather than all the way off and that's what that little 17.5 millivolts and of course they're they're the the voltage that they're doing you know that they've chosen there if you use ohms law this is a 0.5 ohm or a one half of an ohm resistor and if you do the math it will act you can actually calculate the idle current and that's really what they're the, the voltage is just representing an idle current that you want flowing through the transistors so you have that little initial idle current you're they're just barely turned on and that's where you want them to work and that's where they'll operate with the lowest distortion and so forth again that also affects low volume listening um, if those are if, if the DC offset and idle current are a little are set wrong you know not grossly wrong but wrong the most effect that it's going to have is at low volume levels um, as you crank the amplifier up you know you kind of it, it kind of you don't notice it as much at least to your ear but you can low volume le levels you will so if you ever have an amplifier that sounds really really good at low volume levels you know that you don't need to turn the volume up to hear all the sounds I can pretty much tell you that that's going to be an amplifier that's been well aligned and that's that's aligned properly and everything's working right so that's it so let's check and see what kind of uh, output we can get from this thing so we have all the test equipment set up and can you hear that? Listen very carefully. Nothing. Isn't that beautiful? I actually got up really early. Everybody's still in bed. It's a nice early morning. It's actually Thanksgiving morning here. Um, so happy Thanksgiving to all you here in the States and happy Thanksgiving to all of you. You know, I wish the best to everybody. You know that all the time I say that. But anyways, here we are. So I have this thing set up. I have a one kilohertz tone in there. And uh, let's take a look. And remember, I'm, I'm switched to times 10 on my dummy load. So whatever we read here is actually 10 times, uh, you, you know, what we're actually, is actually one tenth of what we're really getting. So let's go up. Oh, it would help if instead of the tuner I selected auxiliary one. <laughs> Let's try it again. Okay. And you can see. Let's spread this out. And once again you can see one channel actually got a little more gain than the other. And again that is the a lot of these old amps, you know, the balanced pots or the volume pots are not, do not track perfectly. So, you, you know, if you want, you, you usually won't hear this when you're listening to music, but when you have test equipment with a set value put into each channel, you can actually see that the gain is slightly different and we can actually adjust the balance just a tiny little bit and you can see we can get them to pretty much match up. If we want to fiddle around with it enough. 
and there you go. So we have, right now we're looking at 2.64 volts, which is 20, 26.4 on the bottom one, and yep, about 20, let's say it's bouncing around, let's say 26 volts, okay? So let's check that real quick. So after our alignment, we're getting out of our 75 watt receiver, we're getting 84.5 watts per channel. Now again, we're just visually looking at the waveform. <clears throat> so there probably is a little bit of distortion in there, uh, but it's not very much because you can't see it on there. And if we wanted to connect up the distortion meter, we could really go crazy on that. But it's safe to say that if we're getting 84 watts or 85 watts per channel, before we can see any visible uh, distortion, you can pretty much say that if this is rated at 75, when you go down to 75 watts per channel, it's pretty clean. So that tells us that uh, we, we've been successful. Everything's good here. So uh, off camera, I've also gone through and I've cleaned everything up inside. Uh, spoke to the owner and we had a little discussion about, you know, uh, how much we want to spend and invest in this re restoration versus you know how necessary everything is so what 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 he's opted for is we're not going to rebuild the tone control or preamp section and we're not going to recap the the uh, tuner section uh, the tuner is perfectly aligned am and fm i went through that offline you know off camera and to be honest with you, this thing is performing very well uh, with all of the, you know, all of the vintage components in the tone control. Of course, your tone control section doesn't really have a lot of voltage applied to it. Uh, the capacitors and things don't take the abuse that some of the higher current devices, you know, would have. Um, will it affect the sound? Yeah, it can a little bit. Um, you won't see it on an oscilloscope but you can probably hear it a little bit. I would imagine if we recapped the tone section, it would give you a little bit brighter sound. Um, it usually does, but that's not always necessarily the truth. Um, I just know that I've, I've put a signal from 20 hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz on this off camera, and it's tracking very flat and working very well. At 20 kilohertz, I am getting a little bit of distortion. And I can show you that real quick. Um, hold on. Okay, this is 20 kilohertz that you're looking at right now, and you can see it's dead on. And when we really get the volume cranked, it doesn't flat top. Before it flat tops, you can see it just starts getting that little funny looking waveform. And it only does that at the higher frequencies. And what Probably recapping the tone section may or may not correct that a little bit. And again, at lower volume levels that you would be listening, and you know, we're right now, according to the watt meters, we're probably doing about 15, 20 watts per channel right now. You don't have that. So you'll only see that at high volumes. Um, and it's just, you know, once again, I don't know that recapping it, the rest of it would change that very much. But bottom line is this thing is performing very very well and we're going to get it buttoned up and <clears throat> get it back to the owner so he can enjoy it and uh, I hope you all enjoyed this video uh, if you did give me a thumbs up I wish you all the best in the world good health peace joy and happiness in your lives and I appreciate every one of you your wonderful comments your kind words and uh, hope that you'll keep watching and uh, until next time Take care, everybody, and uh, I'll keep the videos coming as long as I have the time to do it. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.